Welcome back, everybody, and once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, the first panel for our webinar is, as Dr. Singh mentioned, is Guru Tegh Bahadur's online representations and his depiction through Sikh relics and artifacts. And in this panel, we have, we'll be joined by um, two individuals, both joining us from the UK, Dr. Jasjeet Singh and um, Gurinder Singh Man. So first individual who will be speaking for this panel will be Dr. Jasjeet Singh, who will be presenting a paper, Sikhi Online and Representations of Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji. Dr. Jasjeet Singh is an associate professor in the School of Philosophy, Religion, and the History of Science at the University of Leeds. His research examines religious identity and processes of religious and cultural transmission among Sikhs in the, in the diaspora. Dr. Singh has a strong track record in academic and non-academic publications and regularly engages with media and policymakers on contemporary issues relating to religion and identity. Regarded as an innovative and impact related work, Dr. Singh has pioneered methods of community and policy engagement through presenting his research at open events organized by Sikh organizations. He is regularly invited to present on his experience of community engagement, including by the Institute for Government and the UK Research and Innovation Council. And, and he also appears on national and international media speaking about Sikh issues. His current research focuses on Sikh media and on digital Sikhi, for which he has released an online survey. Dr. Jasjee Singh, the virtual podium is now yours. Thank you, Desbal Singh. Can everyone hear me all right before I carry on? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, okay, great, brilliant. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, obviously, I would much prefer to be in California in person, but um, this is a great second best. So let me just see if I can uh, share my screen. So today I'm going to speak a bit about uh, Siki Online and a bit about some emerging research I'm doing on uh, on representations of of, uh, of Sikhi online uh, and thank you for the opportunity to actually kind of test this out with uh, the representations of Guru Degh Bahadur Ji online which is obviously um, a theme of the conference so I'm going to speak a bit about digital religion as a field which is which is something I'm getting increasingly interested in um, a bit on on the emergence of Sikhi online and Guru Degh Bahadur Ji online in particular and also a, a brief examination of the of the celebration of the 400th Prakash during the COVID-19 pandemic, which obviously, you know, was a key was a key um, a key focus of celebration, but this is probably the first time where it had to be actually be done online as a consequence of the pandemic. So, how did how did six nationally internationally respond to the fact that they had to celebrate this Guru um online? So, digital religion as a field in in academia, quite a you know a, a recent emergence but something that's very very interesting that you know that i find interesting which asks the fundamental question um what happens when online and offline religious spheres are blended and integrated so what's the impact of the offline on the online and vice versa how do religious practices adapt to digital environments and what's the consequences of that and there are generally three areas of focus in this in the in the field of digital religion which focuses on the impact of the digital on religious identity, authority, and community. So I'm gonna look at these themes as I move through the presentation. And I've done some work in this, in this area already in my 2014 article, looking at the uh, impact of the dig digital arena on young Sikhs in Britain, particularly on the focus 
on the focus on religious transmission, so how people learn about uh, religion and culture. Uh, and in this in this article, I've kind of mapped the emergence of, of, of Sikh websites. What's interesting in the Sikh case is that many of the of the websites that emerged in the early 90s to the mid 90s uh, through 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 Usenet groups through the first website in in 1994, um, many of the Usenet group discussions and many of the Yahoo group and Google group discussions were focusing on the relatively recent events of 1984 and the consequences of those in the Punjab in the late 80s and early 90s as well. So unlike other traditions which maybe appeared online in the, se the same kinds of times, um, the online environment at, th at that particular period played a very important role in bringing Sikhs across the diaspora and in, in the Punjab together to discuss this very recent issue um, and current issue of the events that, that were taking place in the Punjab. So. 84 was a was a key driver to some of the emergence online and beyond that you saw the emergence of websites like seeks.org, Sicknet in, in 96 and then a whole host of different websites um, emerging from the late 90s onwards through to the mid 2000s maybe. And much of the early scholarly analysis of the impacts of the internet looked at these websites and at this time there was still a distinction being made between the offline world and the online world. So the, the online world was seen as this sphere of its own, and the offline world was, you know, stuff where a place where other stuff, other other stuff happened, but there wasn't necessarily a link between the two. This has obviously changed as technologies changed, and, and as Siki has uh, appeared in the digital arena in different ways, primarily through the emergence of of social media and different kinds of social media. So whereas websites and discussion well not not discussion forums as such but whereas websites in particular were mainly one way so it's this is information that you know you can you can take on board the social media in particular and the reason why it, it's become one of the reasons why it's become so popular is because it's it's much more of an interactive um channel so all of these channels like facebook and and, and twitter and and whatsapp and m more recently TikTok and the like uh snapchat discord and the like are, are much more interactive. So really interesting to see how the the interactivity of this of these new kinds of technology is impacting on those three things I mentioned, authority, community, and identity. In terms of its arrival online, Siki was generally later, it arrived online later than most other traditions, but I'd argue that given Sikh's, uh, given Sikh's you know, interest in technology, they 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 really do take the, take new technologies up very very quickly. So there's been lots of use of YouTube and and Twitter um, and WhatsApp, as everyone knows. I'm sure everyone's members of m numerous WhatsApp groups and you know re receives lots of WhatsApp messages every day. So in my um, in my 2014 article, which uh, which was based on interviews and an online survey, I basically found you know a whole host of reasons why Siki, why Sikhs were engaging with Siki online, ten of which are are listed there um, and as Dejbal mentioned I'm, I'm actually running an online survey at the moment uh, which is running until the Gurburb on the 19th of November so about six days um, so if you haven't filled it in yet please do fill it in I've had responses from all around the world you know the, the US Canada UK Finland Portugal um, obviously Punjab and you know Australia and whatever so if you haven't filled the filled the survey in yet um, please do and it's it, you know it's really um, giving me a, a very interesting picture of the ways in which uh, Sikhs in the diaspora and Sikhs around the world are using the online environment to engage with Sikhi so there's the link um, please please do, do fill that in so I'm just gonna given time I'm just gonna um, yeah just whisk through this a little bit so in my 2014 article and I've uh, uh, up to up to now I've looked at the impact of the digital arena on authority. Campbell talks about different kinds of religious authority that are impacted by the the online environment, hi hierarchy, structure, ideology, and text. And you can read about the ways in which I've argued that um, the online environment has impacted these for for Sikhs. I'll just uh, whiz through these ones and move on to. So in my, in my in my 2018 article. Lost in translation, I examined how the emergence of the digital guru 
uh, has impacted on Sikhs' engagement with the Guru Granth Sahib Ji and, also, and in particular um, on the fact that one translation has kind of become the de facto translation as a consequence of it being the most readily available translation online. Okay, so that's all the, all the, all the previous stuff. So looking at Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji on, on, online specifically, um, really interesting you know, analysis, uh, and I've tried to look at different aspects of this. So firstly is the, is the imagery. Um, and not surprisingly, and this is true of many of the gurus really, if you, if you, if you do a Google image search of many of the gurus, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, Guru Deg Bahadur Ji, um, Sobha Singh's paintings generally are the, seen as the de facto images, uh, and there's various variations of these, but generally speaking, Sobha Singh's images, for some reason, because they've probably become digitized early, have become the de facto image of the guru. And you see these being used across the board um, by companies, you know, who, who are saying they, they're celebrating, um, you know, the Shahid the Guru, for instance. Uh, and it's, it's the same image used, used, used in, in a number of ways. Also found, um, interestingly, various, uh, you know, other kinds of di digital um, resources. So how to draw Guru Tegh Bahadur, Ninth Guru of the Sikh religion on YouTube was something I wasn't expecting to see. But again, the, um, the, the, Im the image presented is, isn't Sobha Singh's painting, but I'm, I'm not sure how this has become a representation. Um, and that's something I'll be, I'll be looking into. Although there has been, and this is this is where the online environment does allow Sikhs the space to do this. There's been a you know a, a, a challenging of these particular images. So much more discourse around older paintings, in particular from the you know from the 18th and 19th centuries, and other representations of the Guru to kind of challenge challenge the hegemony of the Sobhasing image, which is which which as we've seen is the, is the main image online. So this provides a, a lot more diversity of the images of Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji online than maybe um, were around originally. And also you see other, other um, initiatives emerging, the, the Mahalla 9 website um, encouraged artists, encouraged Sikh artists from across the diaspora to produce their own interpretations of, of the Guru. And again, in time, these will maybe displace some of these images will maybe displace the subbusing image as the as the de facto image and you can see lots of different kinds of interpretations of the guru there in terms of age age and appearance and the like so again displacing this kind of normative subbusing image is is the guru Tegh Bahadur image and in terms of how the prakash tehana was 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 um was uh, celebrated during the COVID pandemic. So obviously, you know, normally events would, would take place in person. And, and the interesting question is, how did Sikhs respond to the fact that many of, many of us were in lockdown and unable to actually celebrate the 400th Prakash uh, in person? So the kinds of resources that, 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 that have been provided included uh, Kirtan Gurbani, Gurbani um, lists of, of Kirtan in, in, in various styles. Um, particularly Ra Kirtan, stories of the gurus available online in, t in the form of, um, of audio stories as well. So again, it's interesting to see how Sikhs have responded to this and the kinds of resources that, that are being made available. Um, short films, uh, question and answer sessions about the guru produced by recognised um, Sikh, Sikh YouTube uh, channels like Basics of Sikhi, you know, for instance, all, all responding to this um, need for online resources at the time. Virtual satsangs taking place. I think these posters are from uh, Sikh Inside based in Malaysia. So again, not just something that's, you know, uh, uh, UK, US, Canada, di different Sikh communities from all across the diaspora responded in, in different ways. And interesting to see how um, Sikhs were asking Sikhs to participate or to, you know, participate in the, in the 400th Prakash. So, for instance, it says here, recite to Serj Bhatt uh, in over a year. So, looking to see how um, celebrations could be done or participation could, could take place uh, in, in, a, in a virtual context. Uh, and a whole host of um, online events organised um, from the Punjab itself as well with, with YouTube links 
and the like uh, taking place round about this time last year. And finally, I'll, I'll, I'll finish uh, on, um, on uh, the, the question I, I ask myself here is, what, what impression would you get or what would you learn about Guru Tegh Bhattaji if you, uh, if, you, if, you, if you only looked to learn about the Guru from an online perspective? So if you Googled Guru Tegh Bahadur, and Google is the, is the most popular search engine by far, so most people would use Google uh, as, as the starting point to, to, to learn about anything, really. Um, the, 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 top, the, top res, the top response to this search would be, uh, would be Wikipedia. So Wikipedia, for those of you that know, is an online encyclopedia um, which, people, which anybody can, can, um, can edit. So, what I thought I'd do was I th I thought I'd actually so yeah so these are the these are the top four um, responses to a search on Google of Guru Tegh Bahadur. So Wikipedia, Siki Wiki, the BBC, which you know is also uh, an authority, and the Encyclopedia Britannica. So interesting to see which sources become have become the go-to sources. Now this is this is very important for Sikhs because. Um, so I currently do quite a lot of work with RE teachers in, in the UK. Sorry, uh, that, that's um, teachers teaching uh, religious education. And th these would be the sources that they would therefore go to if they Googled Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji. So these, these sources would be where they got their information from. And it's interesting to see the, the, the emergence and the development of uh, these resources over the period. So I, I looked at the Guru Tegh Bahadur Wikipedia page and did some analysis of how how it had changed, where, when, it, when it first arrived and how it changed and what kinds of information were being presented about the Guru at this time. So, and this is, this is a very, very important question for Sikhs worldwide because Wikipedia has grown to become the largest reference website, attracting 1.8 billion uh, visitors per month as of August 21. So this is generally the place where people would find out about things they didn't know about. An interesting aspect to the creation of Wikipedia pages is that the, the majority of contributors are male. Um, Google and other search engines actually prioritise Wikipedia and you often find uh, Wikipedia facts presented in fact boxes. So these facts kind of become the most important or the facts that are, that are really highlighted. And there's a whole host of principles that govern uh, Wikipedia content, in term, in, including content must be seen must be a neutral point of view must be verifiable and can't be original research so there needs to be some some degree of referencing so I'll, I'll just finish by just talking a bit a, a bit about the development of the Guru Tegh Bahadur uh, Wikipedia page so this is how it first looked in 2004 when it first emerged online um, and you can see <coughs> you know basic information uh, and in terms of external links it's linking to other Sikh websites, so all about Sikhs, Sikhs.org, and SikhHistory.com. Um, so not 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 any academic referencing as such, but a kind of reproducing other material online. And then the references stay pretty much the same. 2008, 2012, uh, you see some references uh, to to Srinder Singh Godley's book, The Sikh and Sikhism, so and you know and, and Sikhism, but otherwise. Uh, no academic references but then by 2021 if you look at the Wikipedia page now um, I'll see if I can just see if I can zoom in this is this is important for us academics in the room uh, you can see the kinds of resources that are listed now are primarily academic resources so the Oxford Handbook of Sikh Studies is the, is, is the number one reference um, so you can see how the how the story of uh, the, the Guru, the Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji Wikipedia page has changed over the period in that now it's very important that uh, the, ref the, the, the information presented on the page is, is sufficiently referenced. So this is, a, this is, I suppose, this is a good place to conclude in, the, and in, in, the, in that it highlights the importance of, uh, of academic work in this area. And interestingly, much of the academic work that has been referenced since then didn't exist in 2004. So unless the work is produced, resources like Wikipedia won't be able to present um, peer-reviewed academic material on, on Sikh history. And I think I will finish there. So just the last thing to say is uh, please fill in... Oh yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll just say the, the BBC 
is still used as a, as a resource by religious education teachers in the UK, even though the page was archived in 2009. So there's a really interesting question here about which resources online become uh, expert and are seen as resources that people should go to. So I'll finish there. If you haven't finished the, filled in the survey yet, please do. Thank you very much for having me. Wajju Khalsa, Wajju Kifade. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And I, you know, for a wonderful presentation, I think in this digital age where a lot of, I know that a lot of the youth and you know, several individuals are engaging with Sikhi online, it's very interesting to see. And is, I'm glad to see someone who is now researching you know, online Sikhi. Um, for those of you guys do have questions for Dr. Jasjee Singh, please use the Q&A feature and we will um, have the Q&A at the very end of the panel following our second speaker. And please do fill out the survey so we can have um, to help Dr. Dr. Singh. Thank you. Our next individual who will be speaking for this panel is Gurinder Singh Man. Gurinder Singh Man is the director of the Sikh Museum Initiative. He holds an MA in South Asian religions from De Montfront University in Leicester. He is the co-author of two books on the Sikh martial scripture, Siri Dasam Granth, Questions and Answers, in from 2011 and the grant of Guru Gobind Singh essays lectures and translations published by Oxford University Press in 2015. He's also author of the British and the Six discovery warfare and friendship circa 1700 to 1900 which was recently published in 2020. He has co-convened five international Sikh research conferences which take place at the University of Warwick Gurinder has researched and discovered many Sikh artifacts and relics, as well as delivering lectures across the world for 20 years. He set up the Sikh Museum Initiative in 2015 to research the numerous Sikh relics and artifacts in the UK. His recent project has recreated artifacts and relics as part of the world's first Anglo-Sikh virtual museum, which can be seen at www.anglosikhmuseum.com, which I'll also share in the chat um, shortly. And he is currently working on his next publication, The Rise of the Sikh Soldier, due to be published next year. And similarly, um, if you have any questions for our next panelist, please um, utilize the Q&A feature. Gurinderman, the virtual podium is now yours. We cannot hear you. In the meantime, um, just so we're not um, wasting any time and while we're figuring it out, we can um, take a few questions for, for Dr. Jasjeet Singh. So we had one, uh, Dr. Jasjeet Singh, we had one individual who, uh, who was asking from Gurdas, now that Sikhi mm. has gone online, does, do you believe the presence will continue, especially um, with online lectures and webinars? And I think it's also very interesting given you know the pandemic and now we have gone and shifted to a virtual yeah. everything. It's a really interesting question. I think there's been lots of things that, that mean that it's not going to go back to what it was. So for, for example, um, so in the UK, lots of organisations are based in London and, and Birmingham. So you, previously, you would have to physically attend meetings, for, for example, right? I think what's happened now is since everything's gone online, what I've noticed is there's lots more, lots more geographical diversity in terms of who attends um, meetings because people can attend from anywhere so I'm hoping that means that maybe people who didn't have the time and particularly maybe you know in terms of gender as well I'm hoping that the, that the online environment will open up um, some of these meetings and, and discussions to people from more kinds of kinds of backgrounds really so I don't think we're going back to to what to where we were before I suppose the only issue is that now there's so much online it's a question of um, I mean, you know, you can ba basically all the all the all the questions have are pretty much been answered everywhere. But the, it, it's a it's a case of kind of trying to understand what material. And this is really this is really funny actually. So, in I mapped I mapped the questions that were being asked in the Usenet groups in 1995 and 96, and it's pretty much it was about caste, meat, translations, you know, Punjabi culture and Sikhi, and pretty much the same questions are being asked on Twitter 20 years later. So it's, it's interesting to see there's very little institutional memory online. And I'm not, I'm not sure why that is, because it's so easy to find answers to questions. I'm not sure why people still feel the need to ask the same questions 
online again and again. But in terms in terms of the question, um, you know, will th will things will things kind of stay as they are? Yes, I think I, online online lectures and webinars will definitely will definitely continue. Yeah. Follow up for you, um, Dr. Singh is, you know, with the, with every, as you mentioned, like we have, you know, the same questions that are reappearing, right? So do you feel as if now that everything is with, now that we're gonna go, you feel like we're gonna continue with this virtual space and do you feel like we'll be retaining that knowledge? You know, the question that we we're getting from 20 years ago, we won't be <laughs> seeing a repeat or how do we ensure that, you know, the community does have this like sustained knowledge or do you even think that's possible with you know, from generation <laughs> yeah. to generation it's a really good question i mean and i think i think when you get to my age you kind of forget there was a time when you kind of didn't know stuff yeah so it's important i think to recognize that people are all on a journey and you know they are they are going to want to find they're going to be asking questions they're going to want to find information now where they do that is is interesting. So for so for some it depends on which group they're already affiliated to. If they're if they're if they are affiliated to a group, uh, for others it's just a case of finding whatever information is best presented. Which is where, so which, which is why SickNet becomes so became so important in the uh, late '90s, early 2000s because the, the the kind of products they were producing, you know, the videos were of very high quality. Um, since then, basics of Siki have kind of become a fundamental. YouTube channel because again the resources they're producing are are really good. Uh, Nanak Nam, for instance, as well. So um, much of it depends on the quality of resources and the ease of access. Um, and you know we see this as lectures as well. You know s students say they like short, short, sharp videos, uh, and that's pretty much um, the way in which I see much of the content that's produced online being presented. And then um, could you also share with us? Um from your thoughts, you know, some of the positives and negatives effects of online Sikhi. Yeah, so this is a question that I actually ask in my survey. Um, and obviously, you know, I, I can't give too much away, but from what I can tell, uh, positive effects is, is, is kind of what I just said in that you may grow up in a, in, in a family or household where you have one interpretation. Um, and obviously the online environment opens up many other aspects of Sikhi to you that you wouldn't maybe have known about otherwise. So. Uh, more more awareness of a diversity the fact that you can ask questions online that you maybe couldn't ask in your in your household about sexuality issues for example um you know and and, and other kinds of um you know uh, taboo quote subjects so that i'd say that's that's a good thing negative wise uh, anyone who's been on seek twitter knows um it can get a bit hairy um so it's it's a bit of a war zone so negative wise i think <laughs> i think uh yeah, it's it's it sometimes gets quite um, personal, maybe. Although there's something I think interesting here about uh, textual discussion versus um, versus this, for example. So I, I don't think it would be, you know, I don't think, for example, me and you, Dejbal, would start arguing now face to face. But that might happen. There'd be more possibility of that on on Twitter, for instance. So interesting to see how different um, kinds of platforms uh, lead to different kinds of conversations. I mean, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, sick Twitter, um, mm. and you also mentioned the fact that you know me and you may not start engaging in a fight virtually, or even if we're in person. But you know, be, being behind the screen, we kind of, mm. and being behind Twitter, we kind of have mm. this. Um, what well, is it's, it's it's performative on Twitter's performative, isn't it? So you mm. know, you're saying something to the public, and you're basically it's kind of saying something about your perspective, and it's it's not as much. It's not as much an answer to the conversation, but it's also saying, "Look to the whole world. Look at me. This is this is this is what I can say." So, sorry, sorry, Tejpal, go on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so thanks for bearing with me, and apologies to uh, everybody in terms of uh, hopefully um, we should get the show on the road very shortly now. Okay. So, I'll try and share my screen now. Once again, apologies for uh, the kind of loss in sound. And um, what I would like to do is actually just firstly, just uh, kind of just uh, basically just say thanks very much to Dr. Pashora Singh uh, for um, inviting me here to actually speak about uh, this particular subject today as well. And also everybody behind the scenes has worked really hard to actually kind of um, get this um, 
basically this um, this great conference uh, to actually just be made uh, live, actually, because especially during um, COVID times, it's been very, very difficult for people to actually kind of get together. So I am going to start off now. So uh, um, I'm going to start off with basically beginning by saying that when we consider the life and contribution of Guru Tegh Bahadur the main area which is discussed is the Guru's conviction in human rights and the freedom of others. This is based on the Gurbani written in the form of Saluks, as well as his ambition to directly intervene in the persecution of the Kashmiri Pandits. So as an emancipator and a harbinger of freedom, it is with great pride we try to interpret the legacy of the ninth Guru. His inheritance from his father, Guru Harukabin Sahib, who, as the sixth Guru, forged a sanctified model giving the saintly role the martial balance. The martyrdom of the Guru reflects the sincerity in which the Sikh tradition uh, fights against uh, injustice and oppression as well. So this particular paper is also reflecting how we understand the Guru from a number of sources, but mainly in the context of relics and artifacts. Whilst academia has constantly looked at Sikh manuscripts um, of late, uh, or maybe past, in the past two decades, to further Sikh scholarship, sometimes the role of the material is sometimes neglected or sidelined. And one of these issues seems to be around provenance, but that shouldn't mean that the oral, sorry, the oral and traditional factors shouldn't be ignored either. And technically, a more balanced approach should be taken. So with that in mind, um, what I'm going to do is move on to the next slide and essentially look at how we can shed more light on the life of the Guru. So in terms of manuscripts, yes, that's one initial idea which we could consider. Another would be per personal material items related to the Guru. So whether it could be uh, things like the shoes of the Guru. And also, um, as um, just Dr. G G Singh mentioned as well, we, talk, we look at portraits as well. So the areas in red, which you can see on the screen, are the areas I'll be considering. But then there's also the idea of public material items. And the way I've kind of uh, brought those down is like items which are either belonging to the Guru or has a testimony which can actually shed light on the history of Guru, Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib and its actual impact, not just at that time, but also for us to learn more about as well. And this includes Siri Sahibs in the form of swords, Hukum Namaz, and a, a small discussion on what we call copper plate, a Tamar Patra, and I'll be discussing that um, just shortly, right at the end as well. And and also talk about the future as well, because we talk about seat rates and artifacts, and this panel is about the digitization, the digitalization, and also the internet as well. So I'm going to touch upon that as well. So I am actually going to begin with by actually kind of... Um, just one, just posing that question about the modern view of the guru. How do we actually perceive the guru? And quite rightly, in, our, in the previous kind of um, talk as well, there's been this idea of what do we see online or what do we actually see when we kind of perceive the ninth guru known as Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib? And how does this contend with earlier portraits in terms of how the guru may have been seen at a earlier time period. And this is really, really important. So do we learn anything new from the past portraits, which either challenges perceptions or enforces them? It's not for me to actually go down this whole avenue in terms of what's right or wrong, but it is something which we do need to speak about, especially when we look at representation of the ninth nice guru. So what I'm actually going to start off with is, is again, something which has been touched on, is the modern idea of Sobar Singh and representation of, uh, of, you know, portraiture, basically, of the gurus. And it's interesting because when we look at the modern kind of uh, representation, say, by Sobar Singh and others, it is more about this meditative state that we see uh, the ninth guru being seen as. And it kind of reflects this idea that... Um, the gurus in deep med meditation, one which resonates with many who see these early um, depictions, and also the early life of the guru where he was absorbed in doing bhakti and and traditionally considered to be at Bakala Saab, um, you know, in the Amritsar district at that particular point. And again, you've got these kind of representations of the halo as well. And interestingly, whilst the halo might sometimes be seen under a, a Christian lens, you do actually see earlier portraits of the gurus with the halo as well, which is also kind of brings that little balance to this as well, when sometimes people criticize uh, maybe portraits 
or which are modern portraits. So to kind of um, take it back in terms of how the guru may have been seen is this portrait, which was published in Dr. Tlitchen Singh's book, Guru Tegh Bahadur, a Prophet and Martyr in 1967. So what we do know is Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib stayed at, the, at Dhaka or Dakan or from December 1666 all the way to May 67, and again from January 68 to February 69. 1669, the congregation of Dhaka Sangat had a mansion built for Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib which is known as Gudwara Sangat Tola. So interestingly, this representation uh, is related to his stay at that particular Gudwara. And what we find is Bai Balaki Das was a chief representative of Dhaka at that time. And he was asked by his mother who requested to make a portrait of the Guru. And she requested a painter by the name of Asan who was a royal painter at the time, to create a glimpse of the divine personality of the Guru. So interestingly, tied in with this image is also some anecdotes which we can actually go to history to actually learn more about this imagery. So according to Surut Das Bala, Bala in Mema Prakash, um, she writes that the mother of Balaki Das has brought the renowned royal painter. The royal painter prepared the portrait of Guru Tegh Bahadur in the holy presence of the Guru. The entire portrait, along with the apparel worn by the Guru, was prepared by the royal painter, except the radiant face of the Guru. Sensing the helpless of the painter, the compassionate Guru got hold of the painter's brush and completed the self-portrait with his own hand. Very interesting, I'll touch upon that in a second. The Guru then presented his portrait to the old lady, the mother of Bai. Balaki Das, a very, very interesting testimony related to this particular portrait. However, that's not the only one. We also get the testimony from Gavi um, Santok Singh in his Suraj Prakash. And he also talks very, very similar to what um, Surud Das Bala uh, has said as well. He states this time, the painter drew all the parts of the body of the Guru in the royal dress in which the Guru was attired. The radiant face of the Guru was blooming like a lotus flower and his eyes were shedding divine rays of grace, which the painter could not withstand. So he expressed his inability to draw the glowing face of the Guru. Then the merciful Lord took the brush from the painter and prepared his face in his own hand and gave final touches to complete his self-portrait. Whoever had a glimpse of this unique portrait was, went into ecstasy. Guru Tegh Bahadur presented this portrait to the old lady personally. After receiving this desired gift from the Guru, the old lady felt a strange tranquility of mind. Wow. These very, very interesting kind of anecdotes related to, which is considered to be a genuine portrait of the Guru at that particular time. So how do we actually read this? Well, the first anecdote actually states that the Guru created parts of the portrait himself, which is very, very interesting if we were to go along those kind of trajectories. Another part of it is the actual dress of the Guru as well. Was this seen as a present or was it, or does this actually represent Sikh sovereignty? Because one of the, uh, the actual anecdotes talks about the kind of, um, the, the actual, you know, the royal dress. So is it his royalty or has this been presented to him? And interestingly, the actual bars or hawk, which is always seen generally in the depictions of Guru Gobind Singh and also Guru Hargobind Sahib as well, is also uh, present in this particular portrait. So this portrait was eventually kept with the descendants of Balaki Das, and um, Dr. Tulichan Singh did manage to get a copy of this, and it was in his particular book. A copy was kept with Anurag Singh in Ludhiana, and then 10 years ago, roughly 10 years ago, I was able to see a copy of this some time ago as well. So it's something which has kind of always been um, um, kind of really been devotional to me to actually understand a little bit more. However, it's also interesting to note how we view this portrait if we compare it with other portraits. And I want to just move on to um, some two other examples. Now, the first one on the left-hand side uh, 
depicts Guru Tegh Bahadur Sahib and is actually a recreation. It's not something from the time, but it's considered to be possibly from the time of the Guru period, but it is an actual kind of um, a re-representation. However, the one on the right, which is from the Mughal Indian school of portraiture, is considered to be from the 18th century. Now, if we look at the two images in front of us, what we do see is some similarities. And the similarities being, when we talk about the Guru in terms of the saintly uh, vision that we see, especially in the representation of Soba Singh, you don't see that here. You actually see the martial tradition and hence um, something completely different. And now in the images, you do actually see two weapon, uh, two weapons. Uh, you see the Qatar on both images, which is the punch dagger or push dagger, which is, is better known as. And we also see the, the sword of the Guru on each side as well. The differences being with one of them, we also have the tal or shield, and we also have the bars or the, or the hawk being represented. So this kind of adds a different dimension of possibly how the Guru may have been seen at an early period. And it's not the only um, kind of depictions which go into this kind of, um, you know, this kind of lens. We also have another image at the Kapani collection, which is considered to be from 1670, showing the Guru depicted with a hawk. And yet there's another example with the Guru with a hawk at the Government Museum and Art Gallery in Chandigarh as well. So it's um, interesting to note these, these kind of differences. Um, but then I thought I'd also look at something which also takes the, you know, portraiture to another level as well. This is modern. This is between the period of, well, modern in the sense of between the period of 1800 and 1840. And what we now see um, is the guru um, again, once again with his sword, but this time he's also got a staff in his hand as well. It could be another a piece of weapon or it could just be a pointer to actually kind of you know, point to actual individuals as well. It's not very clear. But one thing which is different in this kind of representation is the rabab and a musician playing the kind of shabbats possibly or the rendition of music as well. So this actually kind of almost is possibly what may have been more accurate, even though this is from a later period, of the musical tradition and the guru being posing as within, you know, as seen in this martial um, context as well. And this portrait is actually kept at the Royal Collection Trust here in the UK, which is, for those who don't know, is part of the Queen's Collection. Okay, so... That kind of gives you kind of some kind of examples of how to compare and contrast the guru. However, what I also wanted to do was kind of look a little bit back as well to actually understand a little bit about the guru in terms of the martial context as well. So as we understand it from history, Guru Tegh Bahadur engaged in battles under his father, Guru Har Sahib, which means he would have been trained under Baba Buddha and the Guru as well. So interestingly, the Battle of Amritsar, which took place in 1634, was witnessed by the Guru, but it was also at the time of Bibi Viro's marriage as well, so the sister of Guru Deg Bahadur Sahib, and it caused tension at that particular time as well. And whilst the Guru wasn't actually involved in a particular battle, he definitely saw and witnessed the kind of tragedy which was folding with the Mughal forces at that time. However, a year later, at the Battle of Qatarpur, the battle with Binda Khan was actually where the Guru actually did take, uh, did actually um, participate in battle himself. And this is very, very actually poignant because now we actually see the first concept of the Guru um, um, under this kind of martial tradition, so to speak. So we also kind of find out then, because um, in tradition, we also um, hear a lot about the concept of the Guru being called Tiag Mal, and then all of a sudden, you know, this idea that he's now called Teg Bahadur. It's very, very prominent in his, well, prominent in terms of the narratives which we hear. How this actually took place, I'm not so sure how this actually would have been based on this particular battle, but that is a very, very popular narrative. But that's why in my slide, I've also put down battle and uh, with the word S there, because from what we understand, the Guru only took place, some people say, in one battle, which was the Battle of Qatarpur. 
There may have been others, but that seems to be a very, very kind of prominent kind of view as well. So in this context, then, if we look at it from the martial tradition, we also, it's really important to actually understand about the relics and artifacts which could be directly related to the guru himself. So what we do know is that um, many Sikh relics and artifacts of the gurus are kept with the royal house of Patiala, as well as the house of Nabba and Jind. This is all due to the relationship of one individual called Pai Roop Chand, who is a contemporary of Guru Hargobin Saab and provided support for the Guru's armies, then later was appointed to disseminate Tiki in the Malwa regions as well. So this association continued with Guru Dev Bahadur, and when Pai Roop Chand and his son Tarum Chand accompanied Guru Saab to Patna Saab and then to the Dukan, this was all evident. What we do know then is over time, uh, the descendants of Rupjand kept on receiving relics and artifacts, and they've kept this to this very day through the various kind of houses which actually are, are their custodians. So, for example, this particular sword itself is inscribed with Guru Teg Bahadur Azam Abad, and this is actually kept in Patiala. So, within kind of Arabic script or Persian script, as you may, may call it, this was not unusual because we also have a sword of Guru Harkabin Saab, which is also has the, uh, the Persian script inscribed on it as well. So it's nothing different to say that, you know, this kind of, um, the script might have been, um, you know, not within Gurmukhi or Punjabi at that particular time. Moving on from this particular sword is another sword, which according to tradition, uh, was given by Guru Dev Bahadur Sahib to Pai Rup Chand. Now, whilst this actual sword looks slightly different, and, you know, for people who actually understand a lot about metallurgy and also understand about swords, this may be something which may, people may differ on in terms of opinion. However, from the actual house of Bagri and, and their kind of, what's the word, their actual, um, their tradition, this is considered to be of the sword of the Guru as well. And the third one, um, which I want to just kind of discuss, is one which is kept in the house of Nabba. And this particular sword actually has inscribed on it, Sapsi Akal Guru Te Bahadur. And the somewhat um, given on that is 1656, sorry, 1656, which is actually inscribed on the blade as well. So I just want to give a little representation here in terms of what um, could possibly be the swords of the Guru. The actual individuals and custodians have been kind of verified by various other scholars in this particular time in terms of authenticity as well. But I'm going to move on um, to the Hukam Namas uh, of the Guru as well. Now, we obviously don't have a lot of time in terms of actually going through this whole tradition of Hukam Namas, but just to say that primary research has been taken undertaken by many scholars throughout the decades, you know, starting from Gundar Singh and going on to others as well. And essentially, the Hukam Nama gives a great source of study and provides insights into Sikh history. And also, particularly the, um, the Hukam Namas of, of Guru Dev Bahadur Sahib, it gives us information on Patna Sahib and Patan, Benares, the Dhaka, so all the different Sangats that the Guru had a relationship as well. We also glean information on the importance of Diwali, the concept of Khalsa, and the birth of Guru Gobind Singh, noted as Gobindas. So I am going to actually just share one uh, Hukam Nama, which is kept at Takht Patna Sahib. And in this particular um, Hukam Nama, the Guru is actually writing and actually giving great kind of pleasure to the Sangat of Patna. And he's actually saying, he's kind of, congratulating them for the jubilation of the birth of Gobind Das, who we understand as Guru Gobind Singh. And he's giving the blessings to the Sangat of Patna Sahib as well. And he's actually also saying that the Patna, or Patna Sahib is the Guru's home as well. So we actually get to understand a lot more about the kind of intricacies of the Guru, the Guru's relationship with the Sangat through via, um, you know, historical objects like Hukam Nama as well. So I thought that was a very, very interesting concept to talk about, but there's another one as well, which actually, um, this, this was kept at the, or kept at the thick reference library. The important part
part of this hukum nama for me is the idea of the congregation of Patan is directly under the Khalsa. And now this is really interesting because we normally tend to think of the word Khalsa being a word which is you know kind of um, in reference to Guru Gobind Singh. But in this particular hukum nama, we do actually see the Guru referring to the Sangat or the area that he's under jurisdiction as the Khalsa as well. So another another kind of important aspect of how we actually view things when it comes to the Guru. So that was um, some of the interesting aspects of my discussion today. However, I just wanted to touch on one little area as well, what we call the Tamar Patra or Copper Plate. Now, in recent history, this has never uh, not really been touched upon. And a Copper Plate was also within Indian society seen as a way of representation of material heritage. And uh, my namesake, uh, Dr. Man, um, ex-California, in 2008, discussed the copper plate in, in one of his uh, works. I've also discussed it with um, my colleague, Gurmarut Singh, back in 2015 as well. What we do know is that there's evidence of um, these copper plates in relation to Guru Gobind Singh. There's also been evidence of a Tamar Patra in the UK recording, recording the instructions of Guru Hargobind Saab. However, in relation to Guru Dev Saab, there is one example which is kept at Gudwara Hassanpur, Kabalpur, which is in Patiala. However, there has been some debate on whether it's authentic, but it's just a question to open up the field in terms of further research. And also, I've kind of had a reference from a book, um, which is kind of modern as well, which refers to a copper plate as well. So this is more for future-wise and also for scholars in the future to kind of, kind of resonate with is there other areas of, or other avenues where we can actually learn a lot more about Sikh history rather than the traditional um, kind of areas that we look at as well? I'm going to just finally end with the importance of um, uh, digitizing objects and Sikh relics and artifacts as well. And um, as um, the speaker mentioned at right at the start, um, you know, um, it is important in terms of how myself and um, our team is actually kind of looking at restoring and actually kind of recreating objects in 3D as well. Now, this includes various kind of objects in the, in, in the UK, which we've managed to get hold of, and we can recreate. That includes objects like the Pujino diamond itself. Um, there's other objects as well, including um, helmets, uh, which uh, you know were used by the, the Sikh Pajja um, during the time of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and uh, obviously these kind of the last two objects um, that I'm looking at here were actually digitised from uh, the Royal Armoury in Leeds, which uh, Dr. Jasdeep Singh will, will should know a little bit more about as well. So for those who are interested in actually kind of understanding a lot more about Sikh relics and artifacts and how the process of how digitization can help in our understanding, then anyone, everyone needs to go to angloseatmedium.com to actually learn a bit more further about these areas as well. Once again, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's really great to be able to share this um, information with the Sundance today. Thank you for that amazing presentation. And, um, you know, I think it's amazing to see not only someone talk more about the martial side of Guru Tegh Bahadur, but also the importance of recreating the past and kind of recreating history through this 3D imaging that you're doing, which is kind of the, um, the point of my first question for you is, has there been talks or, you know, maybe there's something that you're thinking in the background, but talk about recreating or doing 3D imaging for these relics and artifacts that you just shared with us of, of Guru Tegh Bahadur and, you know, even thinking beyond, um, you know, Guru Tegh Bahadur as well, like you have the Anglo Sikh Museum and amazing um, website and amazing artifacts that you shared, but has there been a focus to maybe, you know, make 3D images of Guru Tegh Bahadurji's artifacts and relics as well? So absolutely, and it's uh, funny enough you met, you asked this question because I did think it might come up as well. For us, the first phase was always about actually kind of digitizing objects within the UK, but that's almost, almost telling a lie as well, because our first object that we recreated was the um, the breastplate or the charena of Guru Gobind Singh, and that was just done from photography. So 
technically, the answer to your question is yes, we would like to do a lot more as well. And is funding based, as you probably may know, and you know, everyone knows it all depends on funding. And the more funding we get, the more we would love to go out to India and to, you know, to the Punjab and actually, you know, digitize these 3D objects and make it not just a small uh, digital repository, but something which gives a kind of complete repository when it comes to artifacts and relics. So the answer to your qu question is yes, but not in the short term at this particular time. Thank you. And then um, there's a question um, referring to, are you aware if the relics in Punjab are open for public viewing? Um, well, in terms of the Punjab, what we do have is well, if you break this down in terms of where relics are, so for argument's sake, if we know that some are kept at in public museums, okay, the, the problem is always the same across all museums across the world. Some objects will be on display and some objects won't be on display. So I'm just, uh, as an example, you may have the government of um, art gallery in Dundagar, for instance, so, you know, you may have certain portraits on display and others not. You could go to uh, Rambag in Amritsar, for instance, and there's a lot of weaponry on display there, but others not. Some of the objects I've kind of displayed, uh, are kind of given um, access to today in terms of, say, the swords, for instance, they're kept in private collections, and the probability of access to those will be very, very limited. It is a bit of a shame because I think, you know, projects like what we're trying to do is trying to kind of bring objects out to the open so the world has a better understanding, not just Sikhs themselves, but the world has a better understanding of what the Sikhs were about and are about as well. So, you know, there is this uh, kind of push to try and get museums across the world to open up their doors so there's greater access, essentially. Thank you. And then um, I have a question from Gurminder Pogal. Thank you for a great talk. Do you have thoughts about why the Rabab continues to feature in painting in the late 18th and early 19th century? Um, why not string instruments which were used by gurus by this time? Is there a symbolic connection between this painting and earlier ones of Guru Nanak with Bai Mardana on the Rabab? Um, is this in relation to the one that I showed with the guru sitting? Right, okay. Um, it's really interesting because this, um, like I said, this actual portrait was from around 1800 to 1840. So it's a little bit different to uh, not necessarily the style in terms of um, what I was just kind of discussing in terms of the swords and, you know, the kind of regal position that the guru's taken. But in terms of bringing the rabab into that particular portrait, I thought was a little bit more fascinating and does go and echo what we do see from earlier portraiture from the time of Guru Nanak. And I'm surprised we don't actually see more of that imagery because, you know, if we are saying that um, the jaw of the Guru is the same, and ho hopefully we would like to say the kind of institutions were the same as well during that time. And the musicology, which was around the time which Guru Nanak had started, should also be kind of, you know, be explored throughout the ages. And whilst we do actually see more kind of portraiture of Guru Gobind Singh, I think there is this missing link because if you look at the portrait of Guru Hargobind Sahib, we do see many, many portraits of Guru Hargobind Sahib and Guru um, Gobind Singh, but more, but the contemporary one of Guru Dei Bahadur is not as many as the other two gurus that I've just kind of mentioned, but it's really fascinating to actually see the Rabab being kind of depicted. And I think, you know, it's a more case of also looking and finding. And, you know, as we go through collections, as things become more available and as verified, I'm sure we will find other kind of portraits as well in the future. Thank you. And then I want to circle back to a question that we received earlier um, from Nicola Mooney. Fascinating talk as always, Jasjeet. I realize you are still collecting data, but could you comment on the element of embodied practice and community in the online environment in the sense that Sangat, Bangat have physical aspects and whether the shift online might ultimately change the nature of community? And also I'd like, um, you know, after Jasjeet Singh is answers the question, I also like, you know, Gurinder Mon for you to consider as well, like with this changing of the nature of the community and shift online and the work that you're doing 
with artifacts and relics that you're discovering, how can how can this be utilized with a shift online? So, Dr. Jazzy Singh first. Thanks a lot, Nicola. Thanks for the uh, you know for the kind comments. Um, so, really interesting question, and again, one I've asked in the um, in, in, in the survey, and it's, it appears that much of it's down to obviously down to physical location of, of participants. So, a number of people have responded saying that they are physically not located near a sick community. So, the online environment really is the only way they could actually engage with any any kind of sick community. And, and the and the the recent innovations, and this is part of the issue of doing this kind of research, is that things are changing all the time. So I've been on Twitter spaces, I've been on Clubhouse, I've been on Discord, which is which have all really only emerged in the past six months or so. Um, and that appears to be facilitating a much, I don't know, a much closer kind of community than maybe your individual Facebook groups, Twitter spaces, uh, sorry, Twitter general and, and discussion groups. So I think, it, I think it will change the nature of community for some. Um, and also maybe I think people may be engaging with the community in different kinds of ways whereas you go to the where you go to the Gurdwara for life cycle rights and and the like um, and for general you know your general weekly um, so, uh, you know doshan of the guru but your discussion about Sikhi and Sikh issues happens online so there may be different kinds of community different kinds of community being used in different ways yeah um just following on from um, Dr. Jajee's thing, um, I think uh, this idea of digital, I mean, I, I mean, I, it's just, just something to kind of share with everybody who's there. I had my first website back in 2001. And, you know, <laughs> we're going way, way back. It's a very, very simple website. And I actually put my dissertation online. So, you know, going, looking at this kind of trans transformative state of a website and what the online, um, you know, media can actually represent Sikhi and how it can actually kind of help is, you know, this idea of um, making things which are kind of Sikhi. Now, when we talk about websites, we talk about how long individuals stay on a site to actually kind of explore information. And uh, what we've been trying to do with our online Sikh museum is not just actually kind of, um, it's just to be a repository for Sikhs, but also non Sikhs as well. And interestingly, during COVID, what we found was that um, we actually engaged with a lot of schools as well. So we engaged with a lot of schools and doing online webinars where people could actually learn a lot more about Sikh objects and the Sikh faith itself through the objects as well. So I think platforms like the Anglo uh, Sikh version is really, really important. And as we kind of transcend the next phases as well, you know, it will be even more important, I particularly think, in terms of how we actually kind of disseminate, uh, you know, see history and heritage. And just another factor to that, whilst we're talking about online things as well, you know, it, it is really important to actually look at how the digital future could actually take place, because whilst we actually have these objects um, available in 3D, sometimes what we've also done is we've actually had um, headsets on and you can actually see what we see through headsets, and that can be transmitted online as well, it, like, personally, like through this webinar itself. Whilst we use our headsets for face-to-face um, -face engagement, um, it, it can also be a really good tool in actually kind of exploring objects online as well. So there's lots of possibilities, and the, and, and the future is really, really bright. And so, um, so gr great question, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have a, um, another question, uh, it's kind of long-winded and then um, for just Jeet, but um, bear with me and then you can also see it in the feature. So it will be interesting to hear from Dr. Just Jeet Singh about how the rapid adoption and move to online platforms will result in an adverse impact on the Punjabi language amongst the diaspora. Is Punjabi fast being confirmed as a second language or disappearing in the West rather than mother tongue spoken in homes? Would it be wise for the diaspora organizations and online platforms to try and ensure that a percentage of the content to the excellent quality they create is produced in Punjabi as well as English medium they currently adopt? And do you, does your research and experience show two tier access channels for Sikhi online? Assumption being Punjabi from Punjab and Hindi from India being a different to the higher quality English content from all of the diaspora. Is this a threat to spoken and understanding of Punjabi in the diaspora? So that is a that is an excellent question, um, Rav Rav. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, and what I'm quickly what I'm quickly discovering is how much of the online environment is is political. So, for instance, what I mean by that is um, presence of different languages in different platforms. So, for instance, you, you can't learn Punjabi on on Duolingo. Um, Google Google subtitles only appear in certain languages. So again, these are all decisions that are made by by these corporate institutions. Um, so, in answer to your question about is it going to have an adverse impact? Yes, because so one of the questions I'm asking is, on my survey also is how much content that people consume in different languages, and English is unsurprisingly by far the most popular. By I think it's about eighty percent of con eighty percent of content is consumed in English. Um, which means that Tiki again is is being is being framed in in in, in a particular in a particular language. Um, is Punjabi fast becoming confirmed as a second language or disappearing in the West? Yes, I I, I would argue it is. Um, but if these if these corporate if if Google you know provided um, easy to access or easily usable subtitle services, for instance, you know in Punjabi, then that would that would that would to a degree. Um, ensure that Punjabi was still being used, but but they don't. I think I think I think Hindi's available, but I, I need to check that. But again, this is all stuff that I'd never really considered before. But it's really interesting to look at the kinds of things, the kinds of services that are available or that are made available by these corporate institutions, and why particular languages may be made available and and other ones um, other ones not. Do I uh, does my experience show two tier access channels for secure online? So see that again. This is very interesting as well. So when I analysed some of the um, discourses from from British-born Sikhs and what they were teaching back back in back during my PhD, much of much of the discourse was basically an English translation of Punjabi content. So they'd they'd hear um, you know Vyakya on on CDs and they'd basically translate it and then present it in English uh, to to their audiences. So again, the, the, you know, the, 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 issue, the issue of language is something that I'm gonna be gonna have to delve into more. But not, again, not surprisingly, um, English English is, is clear is clearly the de facto, and that will that will have um, have have consequences. Thank you. And then um, just one final question. I mean, we have several others in the um, Q and A, so I request you to please answer those or type those answers. But for the sake of time, I just have one more for. Um, Gurinder Man is from Rupinder Brar. It was fascinating to hear you speak about Guru Tegh Bahadur's Hukumnama mention the word Khalsa. Do you know when, if ever, this word was used by the Gurus before 1699? And how was it understood by the Panth at the time? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And it's been one that I've been kind of, um, I've had to kind of uh, think about for well, well over a decade as well, because as we traditionally see the word Khalsa being used is always in the context of Guru Gobind Singh and you know the kind of all um, ceremony and everything that goes along with this kind of concept and you know and then after that it's just seen as the Sikh as being the Khalsa. However, the actual Hukam Nama that I actually shared, um, you know, was from a very very early period and you know does actually show that the term would have been used prior to the Sagana of the Khalsa. So in this particular context though, in this particular context in which the Hukam Nama is written, Guru Dev Bahadur is referring to the Sangat as the Khalsa. Okay, so he's referring to the Sangat as the Khalsa, which, you know, isn't too different from the modern terms of what we would refer to as the Khalsa. So I don't think there's actually any ambiguity for the Guru to be referring to that usage. Um, we don't actually see that much, you don't see that much more usage from what I understand of the word Khalsa being used, but apart from the Hukam Nama and then to the transition of what the Guru refers to as the Khalsa as well. So whilst it would have been used, it would have probably been used less seldom until after the, you know, the term Khalsa is actually equated with the Sajna of, you know, of the Kundas of the whole um, ceremony at that particular time. So not a definitive answer, but something which goes along to say it, it is a lot earlier than 1699, which is, you know, the traditional date of the Khalsa being, you know, being recognized, so to speak. Thank you. And thank you once again to Dr. Jasjee Singh and Gurinder Sigman for a beautiful panel about 
um, online sick key and um, sick relics and artifacts. 